I'm going to get off the bed. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> Dear listener, I'm about to introduce you to the how-tos of Genesis residue, from Shakespeare to MF Doom and from Cicero to Ice Cube. You want to know what spoken word is? Listen. That was a piece that I haven't performed ever yet. This was my first time performing that. It's the intro. Um, yeah, I'm going to go back on the bed because I'm not spoken wording anymore. Um, uh, yeah, so this talk is called I Have Found Out How to Be Everything I Want, and I'm going to show you how to do the same. Um, yeah, let's. Oh, I'm so, oh, I can't, oh wow, I can't be on the bed. Okay, um, this is me. Um, this is a collage of every single hairstyle I've had in the past few years. I did this because I've noticed that when I come to talks or works, people are like, hey, there was this really great girl with blue hair. And I was like, that was actually me. And it happens like more often than you think. So I made a collage. This is all me so that forever and ever, this is settled. You have not ever asked me who that girl with the short blue hair was. So yeah, there you go. Um, this is also me. Sorry, another hairstyle. I just realized. Okay. Um, on this side, on the ultimate left, you can see me at a, a legal uh, event, an MUN. Uh, in the middle is a speech that I was doing as a journalist. And on the side, I'm talking as a spoken word artist. And that is, in short, what I do. I am right now wrapping up my studies in international and European law with a focus on human rights. I'm also a journalist. Uh, I've written for One World mostly, for Varagits. I write in Dutch and in English. I write opinion pieces. I interview, I do reviews of movies and books. I do literally everything in journalism. Um, and on the side, uh, spoken word. My spoken word is mostly about inclusion, uh, about race, about gender, about my own experiences <laughs> as a woman, about mental health, about God, about faith. So. There's a lot to cover, but I think these three pictures would summarize it best. So what are we gonna talk about today? We're gonna talk about smart power. We're gonna talk about hard power, soft power. We're gonna talk about power tools. What are your power tools? And we're gonna talk about how power tools can borrow from each other and how my power tools borrow from each other. I see a lot of confused faces and that's really good because I'm gonna explain it. <laughs> so, um, in the study of geopolitics, there is this idea of smart power. On the side, we have hard power. Hard power is the exercise of influence through coercion, relying on tactics like military force, payments, and economic sanctions. So for example, a country who exerts a lot of hard power is the United States. They have a lot of military bases around the world, and that is their exertion of hard power. On the side, we have soft power. Soft power uses attraction and persuasion to change minds and influence behavior. Its sources include, cult include culture, government, political values, and positive global engagement. Now, the United States is another really good example of that. Sorry? Yes, sorry. Another good example of that. But there are a lot of countries that actually have it in their sort of plan to have their culture spread around the world. Israel is a really good uh, example of that. So basically what this theory says, you need both of these types of powers to have proper smart influence or smart power. So this, this theory says this is power, but this is also power. Uh, this is power, Wall Street, but this is also power. Because when you think of a hamburger, what is the first thing you think of? McDonald's, exactly. So, when a country has smart power, it has power in, in your money, in, in how you spend your money, but it also has power in what you think of things to be. When you think of navigation, you think of tum tum. When you think of specific um, companies, you think of companies that are from the US, and that's because they have sort of, um, how do you say, they have completely, um, they have complete control over the power that they exert and how they exert it, and it's really smart. And you can apply this, and I apply this. So first, you need to define your goal. Of course, the US's goal is complete influence or complete power. Um, my goal is an inclusive society. Um, I, on purpose, didn't put a picture here. I was told to use as much pictures as I could. But an inclusive society doesn't look the same for everyone. So there's really no picture to you know, add to this. Um, but inclusive society is my goal. And I am of the opinion that that is a changing and morphing structure that I can't really define for myself. But that is my goal. That is a paradox I understand, but we're just, we're just gonna try. 
So, okay, that shifted. Well, the, the one sort of common denominator between every th single thing that I do is words. Sword, also, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> words like a sword, like a two-sided sword, yeah. Um, words is a common den denominator for everything that I do. So, uh, lesson, if you export a PPT to Keynote, this is what happens. Um, <laughs> So on the side, you have me at the ICJ, was it the ICY? It was the ICY, the International Court of Tribunal of Yugoslavia, which just wrapped up, well, just recently wrapped up. And words in the legal context, they delimit behavior. Um, they're not creative, but they define and delimit the behavior as we do them in the public sphere. In journalism, words explain a review or an opinion or interview. They can explain um, a specific event. And spoken word creates. Spoken word uses words in the most creative way. Uh, it goes above and beyond. Uh, you can use it. It has no limits like the other two have. And as you can see, there's a spectrum to this. Because when I use journalism, I'm not always explaining. Sometimes I am a little bit creating. And sometimes I am a little bit delimiting, depending on how much of a political opinion I ascribe in my piece. But there is a spectrum to this. And if you have listen properly, you can see that this spectrum coincides with our previous slide about hard power and soft power. On the left, we have language that delimits in a sort of hard power way. Uh, law doesn't give us any way out. It delimits our behavior. It's hard. It's institutional. It's formal. And on the up mode right, we have words in their most creative way. So it's the most soft power. You can speak to individuals and change their minds about stuff. It's cultural. So this is how I apply the smart power technique within the work that I do. And very often people ask me, like, how is it possible? When I tell people I do law and I do spoken word, they're like, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't fit together. But I'm here to show you that it does because of the smart power technique. So how can you apply this in your life? The first step is to formulate a goal. For me, that's an inclusive society. That is super broad. It can also be very small. Secondly, define your power tools. My power tool is words. I can use them in the most hard power and the most soft power way, but maybe your power tool is something completely different. Maybe it's tech, maybe it's fashion. And the last one is place them on the spectrum of power and see where your holes are. So sometimes you might have a lot of formal institution power, but you might be lacking in the creative department. And this is kind of amazing because I think a lot of us in this room, we were told that we had to get a real job and that we can be creative, but I'm here to show you that creativity needs real jobs or institutions, and institutions need creativity. So they borrow from each other, vice versa. So now we're going to talk about how law and spoken word influence each other, and I'm going to show you how they do. And I hope that at the end of this, you can do the same for your hard power tools. Power tools. So, in, um, I've been trained, so let's talk about roots for a second. I've done Latin for, uh, for six years at school. And when I was doing spoken word, I found out that I was actually very much influenced by um, Roman lawyers. Roman lawyers in the old times, they had sort of oratory um, stories, and they used a lot of literary devices that I today use in my spoken word. So in a very interesting way, my law is coming back in my spoken word. So because I'm a nerd and I love to look at literary devices in hip hop and spoken word, we're going to do that. So on the uh, left, we have uh, an alliteration from Cicero. Cicero is one of my favorite Roman lawyers. And he said, pecunium plurimum pulsa, which means money rules all. This was in a case, I'm not sure what case that was, but this is what he said. And this is an alliteration by one of my favorite, favorite, favorite ever rappers. If you ever have time to look up Mr. MF Doom, he always wears a mask, just like the actual Dr. Doom from the Marvel series. Doesn't matter. Anyway, um, so he said, for follow, for now, for no formidable fights, I've been formed to forget for pharaohs, fucks familiar foes, first before fondling female MCs, firstly focus upon the facts that facts can be fabricated to form lies. My phonetics alone forces feeble MCs into defense on the fly, feel me for realer on Figaro. And this is a feature, guys. 
That was a feature, crazy. But this is how MF Doom takes something that was a thousand years old and just takes it to the next level. But it's, it's, it's intentional. He knows that he's doing it and he knows how literary devices work. So the next one is a chiasmus, and that's just called a chiasma, and it's based on the Greek letter he, which is a cross. Basically what it says, if you can put two sentences below each other and the two words form a cross, so um, Cicero again says, pater de fili morte de patris filius, so fili and filius, and uh, pater and patris, those two, if you put them below each other, form a cross because those two words are the same word. It doesn't necessarily have to be the same word, it can be the same type of word, so it could be noun, verb, verb, noun. Each wept not for his own punishment, but the father for the death of his son, and the son for the death of his father. And then this amazing guy did the same thing. Uh, laid back with my mind on my money, and my money on my mind. That's a chiasma. Snoop Dogg is using a Roman literary device. Kind of cool. Um, and then the most famous one, I think, that you, all of you know, and the funny thing is, we don't even know if he said this. He allegedly said this, but Veni Vidi Vici, he said this when he took a very, like a very fast, quick battle uh, of Zela, apparently, 47 BC. Veni Vidi Vici is a tricolum because it sort of lines up three things, and these things are increasingly more active. So I came, I saw, I conquered. That's increasingly more active. On the flip side of this, Kendrick Lamar, wifey, girlfriend, and mistress on backseat freestyle is decreasing in the amount of commitment that he has to the girl. So <laughs> wifey, girlfriend, mistress. And I think that's really cool because he flips a tricolon on its head and gives you, like, and it gives so much rhythm. I think that's so cool. And it's so, it's intentional. These rappers and these spoken word artists, I do this super intentional. And the next one is, not a literary device necessarily, because if you look at texts, whether it's Roman or it's a rap verse, you can put a lot of layers on it. So you can look at the rhyme scheme, you can look at the cadence or the rhythm, you can look at the literary devices, and you can also look on the contents, which is usually where a lot of fun stuff happens. Double entendres and the elusive triple entendre in hip hop, not often done. Um, Catullus was, in Roman liter literature, the one who did the most double entendres and puns, mostly because he wrote a lot about sex. Um, I'm not sure why double entendres in Roman literature only happen when it's about sex, um, but Catullus talked a lot about his sparrow, Catullus giving someone his sparrow. And Roman um, people who studied that a lot were for a long time wondering whether or not that was a double entendre, and they found out that it most definitely was a double entendre for his dick. Um, and then this guy next to you, Loaded Lux, which is an underground rapper, he says, the jail, the jail feels like shampoo, that was the cell sun blue on street fr freestyle. If you look at it first, you're like, hmm, what does he mean? And if you, look at it, if you look at it further, the jail feels like shampoo, meaning the whole jail feels like um, showers because you can get, I'm sorry, trigger warning, raped everywhere. That was the cell sun blue. That was the cell that he blew someone. But you can also say the jail, jail, feels like shampoo. That was the cell sun blue. And if you were an American, you know that cell sun blue is a shampoo brand, cell sun blue. Um, uh, but, so that's a double entendre within a triple entendre because the jail feel like shampoo. That was the sale sun blue can also mean that was the sale. So when he was selling drugs, that was the sale that he blew and that's why he's in jail. So this is a double entendre within a triple entendre. So you can see that through time, we have taken these very, I guess, simple literary devices into the most complex sentences that you have to like mull over and think over. And that's why I love spoken word and rap so much. So this is one of my own verses. And we're going to do something really nerdy. We're going to take out the literary devices. Um, this is a piece that I haven't performed ever, but it's about words and God trying to define God with oxygen from our talk boxes is oxymoronic, like dry ice in dress pants, words will never fit, like trying to fit a square in a round corkscrew, any created consonant would fall through to try and capture God and his vowels, Hebrew. So first, you can take out the rhyme schemes. Um, you can see, it's actually quite simple rhyme schemes, not that complicated. Uh, the O is in the first one, round vowels, 
screwed through Hebrew. And then you can take out the um, antithesis of each other, which is a literary device. So we have square and round, consonant and vowels. And then you can take out the uh, double entendres and the lines don't line up, but I can explain this to you. Anyway, great thing about writing your own stuff. Um, oxymoronic refers to dry ice and dress bands because dry ice is an oxymoron and dress bands is an oxymoron. And then words will never fit refers to God being someone that can never fit in words, but you can also not fit a dress pants because once again, it's an oxymoron and it's a pants. Um, like trying to fit a square in a round corkscrew, you can't fit a square in a round. Um, that wouldn't fall through, but in the next verse I say fall through. Um, any created consonant would fall through to try and capture God and his vowels. Hebrew, if you know the Hebrew language, it doesn't have any vowels. So that's sort of referring to the fact that God cannot fit into vowels. So this whole verse says one thing in a lot of different creative ways. Uh, so that is what I do, and this is super intentional. This is one of my most technical verses, and I sit on this for like an hour just trying to fit, mathematically fit everything. And it doesn't look creative on the first sort of thought, you wouldn't think that creativity is about mathematically fixing something, but it does most definitely have limits. And you get that from, I get that from law. And that is how my creativity works. So basically the conclusion of this talk, <laughs> we don't need to give up our creativity for real jobs. We need our creativity for real jobs and vice versa. And that is what I found out. And I hope that you can also find this in your own lives. Thank you.